After the bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers, a major investment bank, in September 2008, financial markets were on the verge of collapse. Lending had dried up and investors were panicking. As the chairman of the Federal Reserve, Ben Bernanke, said, of the 13 most important financial institutions in the United States, 12 were at risk of failure within a period of a week or two. In response to this financial meltdown, the Troubled Asset Relief Program, or TARP, was drafted and signed into law by President George W. Bush. The goal of this program was to strengthen the failing financial industry, pushing banks away from the brink of failure. These stronger banks would then be able to get back to providing consumers and corporations with credit, a crucial part of a functioning market economy. In this episode, I'll discuss how TARP worked and whether it succeeded in these goals. To understand the logic behind TARP, we must first understand why so many banks were close to collapse in 2008. This is a bank's balance sheet. It'll help us understand the dire situation banks found themselves in at the start of the Great Recession. A balance sheet is a financial statement that describes the bank's assets and liabilities. The assets are the items of value owned by the bank, while liabilities are the items of value owed by the bank to others. Net equity is defined as the difference between the bank's assets and its liabilities. As long as the bank's assets are worth more than its liabilities, then the value of the stuff it owns is greater than the value of the stuff it owes, and the bank has a positive net equity, meaning that the bank is worth something to its owners. If the bank's liabilities are ever greater than its assets, then the bank has negative net equity, meaning that it's insolvent or bankrupt. Put simply, the bank is incapable of paying off all of its debt and is worth nothing to its owners. In the case of a typical bank, the owners of the bank have some of their own money at stake and have borrowed additional funds from others. The bank then uses these funds for a number of purposes, including making loans to individuals and companies, holding some money in reserves, and purchasing financial securities of varying risk. This is typically profitable because the returns generated by the bank's assets are usually larger than the interest the bank pays on its liabilities. Now, in the lead up to the Great Recession, U.S. banks had purchased a lot of real estate related assets. Not only did the banks convert some of their existing assets to real estate investments, but they borrowed additional money to buy even more real estate related assets. This seemed like a smart strategy because real estate offered a high rate of return and appeared safe. And as long as housing prices continued their steady rise and residential loans kept paying off, then it was a smart strategy. The banks would earn immense profits. But at the start of the Great Recession, more and more households defaulted on their loans. This reduced both the value of a bank's loans and its other real estate related assets. For many large banks, those values fell far enough that the banks were in danger of failing. Now, if this were a small bank that went bankrupt, there'd be little concern for the stability of the financial system as a whole. The bank would declare bankruptcy, the shareholders would be wiped out, and the lenders would get any money left over. That's it. But during the Great Recession, there were large and highly interconnected banks close to failing. If these banks collapsed, there would be widespread and acute damage done to the entire financial system. Investors all around the nation would lose money, deposits would be forfeit, retirement accounts drained, and workers fired. Panic about the health of the banks would then ripple out to others as investors would worry about the health of other similar banks, pushing them closer to insolvency. Confidence in the health and stability of the financial market would plunge. This damage would affect employment outside of the financial industry as well. This is because when banks are close to insolvency, they hoard money, refusing to lend to non-financial companies. This, in turn, prevents those companies from having the funds necessary to build new factories, hire workers, make payroll. This was the very real threat facing the U.S. economy in mid to late 2008. In response to this financial collapse, 
Hank Paulson, the Treasury Secretary under President George W. Bush, proposed the Troubled Asset Relief Program. This program was passed on October 3, 2008. The goal of TARP would be to use up to $700 billion of taxpayer money to purchase troubled assets like mortgage-backed securities from the banks. These purchases would raise the value of the bank's assets and increase their net equities. By doing this, the government would effectively push the banks away from the brink of failure. Now, for TARP to be effective at stabilizing the banks, the government couldn't just buy these assets at current market prices because it was those low prices which made the banks vulnerable in the first place. Instead, the government, working through the Treasury, had to pay more for those toxic assets than other investors at the time thought they were worth in order to raise the value of the bank's assets. Notice then the trade-off the U.S. government was making. By overpaying for these toxic assets, the government was making it less likely the banks would fail and increasing investors' confidence in the financial markets, but at the same time opening itself up to charges that it was essentially giving taxpayer money to the very banks that had helped cause the Great Recession. And those charges were made. Just four months after TARP had passed, a Senate panel claimed that TARP had paid $78 billion more for its assets than they were worth. This charge was particularly devastating because the Treasury Secretary, Hank Paulson, was the former chairman and CEO of Goldman Sachs, and it seemed to many that he was giving a handout to his former colleagues. As Paulson later wrote in his book, On the Brink, quote, I expected TARP to be politically unpopular, but the intensity of the backlash astonished me, end quote. There were two other major concerns about the program. The first concern was that TARP dispersed its money very slowly, extending the period of market turmoil. There were technical reasons for this, but still it made the program less useful at quickly reviving the financial markets. The second concern was that overpaying for the bank's assets was a less efficient way of recapitalizing banks than directly providing capital in the form of purchasing shares in the banks. This idea was mentioned in the original discussions, but Treasury officials believe that Congress would never have passed this proposal. Philip Swagel, an economist at the Treasury at the time, has said that Republican House members would have rejected the proposal because it, quote, would have been portrayed as nationalizing the banking system, and Democratic members would not have voted for the proposal without the bipartisan cover of votes from Republicans, end quote. So the idea of directly buying shares in the banks was dropped in favor of purchasing toxic assets. But this decision was soon reversed. The Treasury decided that the banking industry was so close to collapse that it had to switch from buying toxic assets to directly purchasing stocks in banks. These purchases would directly raise the bank's net equity levels, making them more secure and helping to restore confidence in the financial system. To this end, on October 13, 2008, just 10 days after the original bill was passed, officials at the Treasury and the Federal Reserve met with the CEOs of the nine largest U.S. banks, hoping to convince them to let the U.S. government buy shares in their banks. I say hoping to convince the bankers because the Treasury felt that legally it could not force the banks to accept government money. And if some chose to reject the money, it would stigmatize those that had leading them to fail despite the intervention. As a consequence, Treasury felt compelled to offer fairly generous terms to the bankers for accepting money that would help those very banks survive. All banks in attendance ultimately accepted a deal in which Treasury would buy preferred, typically non-voting shares, whose total value equaled up to 3% of each bank's risk-weighted assets. In return, the banks would pay Treasury a 5% interest rate on those shares annually for the first five years, and 9% after that. In addition, the Treasury received the option to buy the bank's stocks at a relatively low price for the next decade, allowing U.S. taxpayers to reap some of the upside potential of saving the banking industry. A similar deal was offered to 8,500 smaller U.S. banks, although they had to apply for the funds. In all, the Treasury spent $245 billion buying shares in 707 financial institutions. Now, given this policy choice, the question is, did it work? Did TARP help stabilize the financial industry?
Did TARP improve the lives of ordinary Americans and revive the economy? Let's turn to the research. The first place to look is at the banks themselves. If TARP succeeded in stabilizing the banks, then we should expect two things. First, the net equities of the banks that received TARP money should have risen by more than the net equities of banks that didn't receive any government money. Second, investors should perceive the banks as being less likely to fail because of the government intervention. On both counts, TARP succeeded. The net equity of banks that received TARP funds grew by 7.7% over the next quarter, while the net equity of banks that didn't receive TARP funds shrank by 7.6% over the same time frame. For its part, the risk-neutral probability of default fell substantially by the very next day, meaning that investors now believed that the banks were much more likely to survive than they were just days before. One other method to see whether TARP succeeded in making banks safer would be to look at investor confidence in the financial sector. A good measure of this confidence is to look at the difference between the interest rate banks charge each other on short-term loans and the interest rate on government bonds. This difference, called a credit spread, tells us a lot about how investors view the health and viability of the banking industry. When this difference is small, investors believe that banks are generally healthy and will be able to pay off their loans. As a consequence, there's little risk to lending to the banks, so investors charge little premium on these loans. When the difference is large, though, investors are worried about the bank's health, fearing that they will be unable to pay off the loans. As a consequence, investors charge a high premium on the bank loans. This graph depicts a commonly used measure of this credit spread. Notice that the spread between the two interest rates is about half of one percentage point during the housing boom, meaning that investors believed that the banks were fairly healthy. In late 2007, when investors started to get worried about the quantity of subprime loans held by banks, the spread began to rise. Then, on September 15, 2008, Lehman Brothers failed. This failure immediately made investors panic about the viability of other banks, leading to a spike in the credit spread. That spread remained large even after TARP was announced and asset purchases began, suggesting that the initial construction of the program didn't lead investors to believe that the policy would end the crisis. It was in part this reaction that helped convince Treasury on October 13th to switch how TARP works moving from asset purchases to directly buying shares in banks. As you can see, this switch almost instantly reduced the spread by one and a half percentage points. The spread continued to fall over the next few months, even dipping below one in January 2009. Investors, starting when the government initiated its share buying program, began to feel increasingly confident in the health of banks. So it seems that the share buying initiated by TARP did indeed improve people's perceptions of the stability of the financial sector. It seems that TARP was good for banks. It raised their net equity levels, making them more able to withstand future losses. It reduced their likelihood of default in the eyes of investors, and it lowered their short-term borrowing costs. A natural follow-up question then is what did banks do with the TARP funds? Did they use the money to purchase safe assets, shoring up their balance sheet and safeguarding themselves against future risks? Did they loan out the money to consumers and corporations, helping to spark economic growth? Or did they choose a different option? Depending on how banks use that additional capital, TARP would be more or less beneficial for ordinary Americans. Trying to determine what the banks did with the TARP money, as it turns out, is more complex than you might initially imagine. Banks weren't required to keep track of how they spent the money, and regardless, money is fungible. To really understand how banks spent the TARP money, you'd need to compare the bank's actual behavior to an estimate of how those banks would have behaved had they not received the funds. As this counterfactual can't be directly observed, researchers who studied this question needed to find a good proxy. For this proxy to be meaningful, it had to involve a set of banks that were essentially the same as the TARP recipient banks, except that they didn't receive any funds. N not an easy task. But two economists did just that. To understand their proxy, 
First, consider the hundreds of publicly traded banks in the United States that were eligible for TARP funds. Here, I've colored the banks using different colors, and each color represents a particular type of bank. These types are defined by the publicly available information about the bank's balance sheets, including their sizes, capital adequacy ratios, and earnings. Red might mean, for example, a large bank close to failure. Blue, a large bank that's relatively healthy. Green, a small bank that's healthy, and so on. Out of the 500 banks or so within the Economist sample, 80% applied for TARP funds. All of these banks in this smaller set were eligible for TARP funds and had taken an action that signaled that they potentially wanted the money. Out of this subgroup, 80% were then approved for funding. The two economists pulled their proxy banks from the rejected category. But critically, they didn't use all of the banks in this category as proxy banks. Instead, they only used the banks in this category that had the same color as a bank that was approved for TARP funds. In doing so, the economists were effectively comparing the behavior of banks that were very similar. They had similar earnings, capital adequacy ratios, sizes, asset quality. They were eligible for TARP money and applied for that money. And yet, they were different along one dimension. Some were approved for TARP funds, while others weren't. This comparison allowed the economists to determine, in a meaningful way, the impact of TARP funds on a bank's behavior. The economists' findings were very revealing. They found that the publicly traded banks that were approved to receive TARP funds were no more likely to lend to corporations and households than similar banks that didn't receive TARP funds. That is, approval for TARP funds didn't lead banks to make more loans. This finding could explain why there were a spate of newspaper articles around this time stating that even profitable and creditworthy firms couldn't get loans to fund their operations. One anecdote recounted by the New York Times in 2009 sums up this finding nicely. After receiving $300 million in TARP money, the chairman of Whitney National Bank, a bank headquartered in my hometown of New Orleans, was asked how he would use the additional capital. He responded with, quote, make more loans, we're not going to change our business model or our credit policies to accommodate the needs of the public sector as they see it to have us make more loans, end quote. Whitney would continue making loans, quote, that we would have made with or without TARP, end quote. By choosing not to increase their lending, banks were effectively limiting how much TARP could improve the lives of ordinary Americans. Instead of making more consumer and corporate loans, the banks that were approved for TARP funds chose to alter who they loaned money to. Specifically, they chose to increase their lending to riskier borrowers who are more willing to pay greater interest rates, while at the same time decreasing their lending to safer borrowers. One interpretation of this finding, which holds especially for large banks, is that the government program was causing something economists call moral hazard, the situation in which someone who is insured increases their risky behavior, knowing that any downside will be borne by the insurer. Applied to this banking environment, the banks that were approved for TARP money understood that the government was effectively backstopping them in case of catastrophe. With this backstop in place, the banks responded by seeking out higher risk, higher reward investments. If the investments paid off, the banks would profit. If the investments failed, the government would take the loss. At this point, you might be wondering, if the banks that were approved for TARP money didn't use the money to increase their lending, what did they do with those funds? It appears that there was a significant increase in the purchases of investment securities, and in particular, risky investment securities like mortgage-backed securities. This might seem bizarre, given that it was this very type of asset that helped get banks into trouble in the first place. But this behavior is consistent with the moral hazard argument above, where banks, having received the government's stamp of approval, use that support to make risky bets, knowing that if those investments failed, the government would be there to catch them. Two other economists showed that this government guarantee had one other major consequence for the financial industry. Lenders, knowing that the government had effectively guaranteed that certain banks wouldn't fail, 
felt secure lending money to banks that received TARP funds, and so were willing to accept a lower interest rate on loan money to those banks. This meant that TARP banks had a lower cost of funds than non-TARP banks, raising their profits and giving them a competitive advantage in the marketplace. This competitive advantage resulted in an increase in both market share and market power for those TARP banks. So, in effect, the government's program distorted the rules of competition. Efficiency was no longer the sole criterion that determined which companies succeeded and which companies failed. Instead, success was partly determined by whether the bank was supported by the government. Making this even more troubling, there's a lot of evidence that banks with more political connections were more likely to receive TARP funds in the first place. That is, controlling for the bank's financial health. If a bank employed a director who had worked in the Treasury, or had its headquarters in key House members' districts, or gave relatively large political contributions to members of important finance committees in Congress, then that bank was more likely to receive TARP funds. So summing up, political connections helped determine which banks were approved for TARP funds, and those TARP funds, by signaling government support, gave those very banks a competitive edge in the marketplace. Given all of these findings, we can now take a step back and evaluate the government's troubled asset relief program. Two goals of TARP, according to the U.S. Treasury, were to stabilize the U.S. financial system and to restart economic growth. On the first goal, TARP was successful. By injecting hundreds of billions of dollars of capital into banks, the Treasury almost assuredly decreased the likelihood that the banks failed. The financial industry was both more stable and perceived to be more stable because of the program. Moreover, from a purely accounting perspective, those capital injections were even profitable for the Treasury. On a $245 billion investment in banks, the Treasury was eventually repaid $275 billion, netting the Treasury $30 billion. Regarding the second goal of restarting economic growth, TARP had decidedly mixed results. On the one hand, stabilizing the financial industry and averting what some called financial Armageddon must surely boost economic growth. On the other hand, TARP didn't encourage banks to increase their lending to consumers and companies, a fact that likely stifled growth and slowed recovery. Further, by distorting the rules of competition and giving a competitive edge to banks with political connections, TARP might represent a persistent impediment to future growth. I'll end this episode with a quotation from Hank Paulson, who helped craft TARP. Quote, I was never able to convince the American people that what we did with TARP was not for the banks. It was for them. It was to save Main Street. It was to save our economy from a catastrophe. Thanks for watching.